these input-output exercises were uh, deliberately brief, but I, I tried to focus on the ones that I, I think you might use more than others. And um, actually, I don't use scan too much. Scan is, scan is very useful for uh, interactive user input. So let's just go through these quickly. So you have these scripts as well. Now, the first question said to um, read in numeric data so you get this sort of output. Well, you could just have a statement in there like this, scan with no arguments. Scan is one of the few functions in R that you can uh, apply, execute without any arguments, and in which case it's looking for numeric data to come its way through the keyboard. So if we do that, and in this case we're applying it, we're assigning it to the variable x. So now it's the only tricky part here. You don't have to enter it through the console, but actually it's easier to do it one way or the other, and I can show you why in just a second. So one way to do this would be just to sequentially enter in these numbers, 3, 5, 6, 3, 5, 78, 29, 34, 5, 1, 78. Wouldn't you know I'd use a long example like that. About the only wrinkle is you have to remember to hit enter twice, which causes the function to stop executing, and then go back up here into change the focus of control, or just focus if you prefer, back up here into the script window, and then start executing again. And we'll see, get down here to the X. Let's, let's take a look at X. So X looks like this. There's X. And mode, we'll, we'll look at mode and type in just a second. There is a slight distinction between them, but you can pretty much forget about it. It's so, it's so small. So the mode of X is numeric. But actually, there can be two numeric types. In this case, they were integers. Uh, three numeric types. They can be real numbers, a double. They can be a complex number, which is complex. So what about character? Now scan by itself, when you just say scan, scan's looking for numeric input at the keyboard, but you can specify the type of inputs. If you want it to be character, you can use the what argument, and this is the default value for what, it's not the default, it's the value you have to give it. The default is numeric. If you want it to be character, you have to put in two quote marks that are separated by a space. And then again, it's waiting with no other values to any of the arguments, other arguments, it's waiting for you to enter at the keyboard. Note you can read in files with scan off of the disk, just like you can with read CSV or read table. It's not commonly used for that, but you can do it. And so here, this time, we want to enter in these colors. So we'll just do the same thing. We'll come down here. And you don't have to enter in the quote marks. It knows that it's going to be a string. It's not really a character or a text. It's called a string data type in to computer types, computer weenies. OK, so we have red and blue green, red, blue, yellow. You have to hit enter twice. And if we look at Y, what is Y? Y is this uh, character vector with six elements. If we say, what's the mode? It's character. That's a characteristic of vectors. They must all be the same type and mode. Now this next one, there's quite a few ways to do this. The most commonly used ways actually are uh, these two, to my knowledge, read table and read CSV, that really do the same thing. Um, you can read 
Excel files indirectly, at least the last I heard, up to 2010. That is, not including Excel 2010. I don't know if that's been changed in a later update. It possibly, quite possibly has. Um, however, and you can use the foreign package, F-O-R-E-I-N, to read in a host of different types of data sets, SAS and SPSS and Stata and some others. And then I believe there is, um, I think it's called read XLS. The function is read.xls, but it is actually in a package, and I don't remember the name of the package. It's uh, perhaps Excel, has Excel in the name of it, but it's a package, as you might suspect, that's designed to help you read in spreadsheets. But again, you're really better off saving your spreadsheets as CSV or text. So here's a little trick. File exists is a function that will tell you if the file is there so that you don't go through the pain of reading it in, see an error, and, and not know why. So if you query, if you say file exists, it'll tell you if it's there. So I know it's there, so I'm going to use read table. Read table really has two main characteristics. It's expecting it to be a TXT file, and of course, .csv files are actually just text files, but the elements are separated by commas. Both .txt files and .csv files are both ASCII files, which just means they have characters. They don't have any stray marks, binary marks, any sort of computer marks. Uh, so anyway, you have to include the full path, and I just put it in there. Uh, regardless of the directory. Retable does two things. It expects a TXT file and it changes it to a data frame. That's important. Changes it to a data frame. Note there's a little anomaly here with Retable and Read CSV. Read table, for whatever reason, expects the header to be missing. And so the default for read table is header is false, and which is almost never true. Header means the at the top of the column. Do you have a label? Do you have a label, a name for that variable in that column at the top of the column? That's what header is. And I, I guess the mentality was, well, if you're saving it as a TXT, it's just data. There's no names at the top. But in fact, almost everybody does put a save it from a spreadsheet or label the top of each column somehow. So you must include this or it will give it its own column headers, V1, V2, V3. So we do this. You must include header equal true with read.table. We do that. And then we can just look at the first six records with the handy head command. So there we go. And it did indeed have headers. There's a header. Note, it did not have this. This is a column, pig's a column. But when we read it in, read table, changed it to a data frame. And when you display a data frame, data frames must have either names or numbers at the top of the columns and at the beginning of each row. That's a requirement of a data frame. So if you don't have them, on the data set you're reading in, R will put them there. And the, so it added these row numbers. And to make matters more confusing, these really aren't row numbers. These are names. But it defaults to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 if you don't have names. OK, so here's the other common input command or function. Again, we're going to read in a CSV, which is just comma delimited ASCII file. And again, file exists. It's handy to see if it's there because I'm, I'm always forgetting where I put stuff. And uh, you, you want to check to see if it's there. OK, so read CSV does the exact same thing as read table. That is, it changes it to a data frame. But the default with read CSV is that the header already is true. It's there. 
So you don't have to put header equals true with read CSV unless it's, um, if it's not there, you have to put header equals false. And in fact, you can read either a TXT file or a CSV file with either of these two, read table and read CSV. All you have to do is include an additional delimiter argument specifying that the delimiter is uh, not a space or not a comma or a backslash or whatever it is. So these functions really are interchangeable, but read CSV is usually used because you don't have to change any of the arguments. So we, then we look at the head of pi data. Again, these row numbers were not there. It added all of these row numbers by virtue of making it a data frame. Now you can also um, use the the mates to read table and read CSV, which is write table, write dot table and write dot CSV, to take a file on your disk, I'm sorry, to take a file in your session, in your work session, and write it to the disk as a text or a CSV. So write CSV will take a data frame and will write it to a disk as a CSV. So this is the name that it's being written to. For example, if we check, let's check. So we check the disk. Is it there already? And it's not. There's no pig CSV. So we're going to execute write.csv pig data. This is the file in our session. And this is where it's going to be written. So we do that. And then we check again. And, and sure enough, now it's there. So write txt does the same thing, but it's, it's for um, txt files. Okay, so much for that. I hope you all got a chance to take a look at that. Um, uh, and really for this reason, you're going to be doing a lot of this. Now, there are there are handy sites. Um, one of the big advantages of R, of course, is that you have a lot of uh, information. Most most of it good, and you can pretty much tell what's good and what's not when you look at it. But Google Google's your friend here. Um, there is there are some very good sites. Statmethods.com, which is actually a consultant site, but he's got a lot of useful primers in UCLA, ats.ucla.edu has a lot of good R training lessons. Okay, so, um, so let's go on. Okay, questions about that? Now, we need to spend just a few minutes talking about basic data structures um, there is up, up on, on rcourses.org, and you all have access to that, there's uh, the very first course, actually, Fundamentals of R, has the second day is devoted to data structures, and there's much more elaborate information. There's about two hours of recordings and exercises and quite a bit of material that elaborates on all of this. So we don't need to spend a day or two talking about this. But it's important. And there, are, there really are four structures that are used a lot and that you need to be, it needs to be second nature what they are. And those four structures are, again, a vector, a matrix, a data frame, and a list. 